But essentially, today's talk is about tackling graft in India. And our speaker will shed light on the state of corruption in the nation at high levels of office and how an individual can fight institutionalized corruption. Dr. Swami is quite expert in this area, having famously fought and won landmark cases that exposed abuse of power in India, including the telecom spectrum case, which was one of the largest corruption scandals in India that results in the imprisonment of a government minister for taking bribes. Dr. Swami is also currently prosecuting a case against Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi for breach of trust and illegally amassing millions in, pro in a property dispute involving the now defunct newspaper, The National Herald. Apparently, the next hearing is on the 14th of December. Aside from being a career public servant, our speaker is also a renowned economist, having taught at Harvard University for around 20 years. Dr. Swamy has a lot of public support for his efforts, also evident from the 3.32 million Twitter followers he has to date. That's impressive. Everyone give a warm welcome to Dr. Swamy. Corruption affects uh, corruption, particularly by high, uh, people in high places, affects uh, our society in a number of ways. Some of them I'll enumerate. First of all, it produces, uh, it induces the production of substandard products. For example, if you are building a road and the tender is put out and it is given to somebody on, on corruption, then uh, in order to recover his money, uh, he, the, the builder or the road layer would use substandard products and uh, that road wouldn't last very long. And this caused enormous inconvenience to the public, but of course, for the public person who may enabled it and the man who got the contract, there's always the next year when the road has to be repaired and rebuilt. Similarly, uh, adulteration of products. Uh, this is possible because by corruption, you can ensure that there is no prosecution of, uh, of anybody. When the corruption takes place, it's done mostly on, cor on cash. And that cash cannot be used for building factories or uh, assets which are visible. And they end up uh, in property deals and the building of uh, palatial mansions. Uh, and this, uh, or uh, using of modern facilities like air conditioners and uh, large uh, LCD televisions, etc. And as a consequence, the investment priority in the country uh, gets distorted because these property um, um, consumer durables, which are of luxurious quality and such like, they earn a higher rate of return on investment. And so we find by a calculation that directly and indirectly in India, 70% of our investment is going to support uh, such uh, non-essential, as we sometimes call it, economic activities. And the common man who needs many of the things like ordinary shoes and ability to afford uh, to travel by public transport, so on, there's not sufficient investments. Schools suffer in uh, rural areas. And all this is because the people who can invest want a high rate of return, and these are the industries where you get a high rate of return. Then the third thing is, since it is done by cash, and uh, the government have made a mistake, I hope they'll rectify it soon, to permit forward trading in agricultural commodities. Very few countries of the world have that, and India, for some reason, 
not in our government, but the pre previous government, they introduced uh, forward trading. And uh, farmers don't have checks, don't accept checks and so on. So when they come to the wholesale market, they, have, they want cash, and cash is available from, from corrupt activities. And so we find many corrupt people now uh, buying uh, agricultural products uh, in, the, in the harvest time uh, in these wholesale markets and then putting them in storages, cold storages, causing an artificial uh, shortage and thereby spiking the uh, uh, agricultural prices. Even if then we have abundance of production in agriculture, which is assisted by a good monsoon rain, we find that uh, agricultural prices keep going up and down. And this is another major impact which is having in our society. There are also other ways where our system is getting destabilized. They uh, corrupt money or the cash is sent out abroad through the Havala racket and returns back to India in the name of some financial derivative which I think no country in the world has invented but the fertile mind of the Indian has. It's called part participatory note. And uh, these are issued by Morgan Stanley, um, um, then uh, U.S. Fidelity Investments, and uh, Goldman Sachs. And with that, uh, you can come. No questions are asked. In fact, the participatory note has no name, no date, uh, nothing except the amount that you put in, and all you need to do is show your passport, and your Indian passport, and you would get it abroad, and then you bring it back to India, and uh, you are free to invest it in the stock market. So in the recent years, this uh, rise in foreign investment is largely due to what is called as portfolio investment, and that portfolio investment is something that can go in and come out at any time. And this causes a great deal of uh, instability in the prices of, in the price, stock market prices. And this is another effect of black money. Finally, since the most of the top politicians in the country keep their money abroad uh, illegally, they use the Hawala route uh, to, via Dubai, to have it deposited in countries like Switzerland, Cayman Island, Virgin Islands, etc. And the, uh, in Dubai, uh, one of the most notorious gangsters from India resides, this is Dawood Ibrahim. Uh, the Pakistan Intelligence Service also is placed there. And they are able to uh, get to know the names of these politicians uh, and what, which bank account they are depositing their money because it is done by internet transfer. And uh, the Hawala agents cannot function in Dubai unless they comply and, co and cooperate uh, with these uh, uh, gangster forces plus the intelligence service of, the, of Pakistan. So I find, I will not name them, but many politicians are uh, now, uh, you know, pro-Pakistan in their, in, their, in their attitudes, largely because of fear of exposure. Now, this has been, uh, this is the documented thing as far as we are concerned in India, and this is something which is very dangerous. So, national interest gets compromised uh, in this process. So, we have a situation where fighting corruption is like fighting cancer in the body. It's a slow debilitation that is taking place in our country, and something had to be done. In 2014, this was one of the major planks. This major plank uh, uh, helped us to win the election. There were other planks also, Narendra Modi's, the present prime minister's own personality. And there was also, for the first time, uh, a identity issue which was silently campaigned for, by which uh, the large 80% population of Hindus 
uh, buried their caste differences, regional differences, language differences, and uh, not all of them, but a good section decided to vote for our party. And as a consequence, we gained 10 percent points in, uh, in our vote, which you would not have had the old divisions uh, that characterized Indian elections uh, had remained. So these three things put together, we got a majority, but corruption was an extremely important part. And in that, uh, I certainly had a major role to play because of the 2G spectrum scam. The 2G spectrum scam was simply this, that uh, the government of India decided to sell spectrum to Indian companies at one-tenth the price it prevailed 10 years ago. And there was no auction. It was what is called as a first-come, first-served basis. So nine people, very important people, uh, had no problem being uh, coming early to get their license. There were 450 applicants, but nine got it. And all nine were present in the minister's room uh, when the, uh, 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 the allocation started. So they all got it because they knew the minister. So this first come, first serve policy, I argued in court, is against public interest because spectrum is public property. Whatever is the airwaves in the sky, it is not a personal property to be traded, but it's something where its public interest is there, and so public interest requires that the best price be obtained for the society. And therefore, auction is the only way by which this could be done. Now, all these nine people who got the license for one-tenth the market price, uh, they decided to offload their spectrum to foreign companies. So somebody gave it to Eti Salat at eight times the price he paid the government of India. And uh, the Tatas sold uh, to half their spectrum for, to Docomo of Japan for 13 times the price he paid. Uh, to, uh, to the government of India. Like that, or someone, I think uh, one company sold it to Telenor. So uh, one to comp another company sold to a Russian company. So they, these, all these nine companies either completely sold the uh, shares, uh, or rather they so gave the uh, spectrum uh, wholly or partly to uh, foreign companies, which found it also profitable to get it. Now, there was a, ba a bar that if you got the spectrum, you can't sell it for two years. But uh, the then finance minister came up with a devious proposal that you can't sell the spectrum, that's true, but you can sell the company. So with it, if the shares or if the spectrum also goes, uh, that's okay. And that's what happened. And so all these points I argued in the court and for the first time, the court said policy decisions of government, if they affect public interest, the court can interfere. And the court interfered, canceled all the licenses, even though most of the operations were already in full swing, and uh, arrested the minister for telecom, got the, I mean, directed the arrest of, and the trial has begun where a lot of big industrialists are involved and uh, several politicians are also there. And I'm expecting sometime uh, next March to see them all convicted and sent to jail, judging by the progress of the court. So this was a landmark which completely uh, shattered the credibility of the Congress party and helped us to win the election. Uh, the Prime Minister, Mr. Manmohan Singh, was a nice, decent person, but uh, he felt that discretion is the better part of valor, and he kept silent most of the time. The money, of course, went to Ms. Sonia Gandhi, but there was no way to prove that. Unless somebody cracks up after he's convicted, then there can be a case launched against her. But in the meantime, I found an interesting secret operation 
which uh, which a mole in the Congress Party informed me of, that the National Herald newspaper has been closed down. That is, it was run by a company called Associated Journals. The National Herald Company, uh, as it is popularly called, was closed down. And it was closed down because it had 90 crore rupees, that's 90, 900 million rupees, um, in debt to Congress Party, which they couldn't pay. Now, why would the Congress Party give such loans? And that's because uh, when it was started, there was only one party in the country, and it was called the Congress Party, and that was during 1937. And after independence, most of the people who bought the initial shares went to different parties. And uh, because Congress Party was considered a party of the freedom movement, and where everybody joined. Uh, but after independence, it became a political party. But the control remained with National Herald. Now, the trick was that Sonia Gandhi and her son created a private limited company. And in that, uh, their share ownership was about 80%. So in a sense, they owned the company. And they had uh, the uh, other well-known politicians of Congress party, like Motilal Vora, uh, Oscar Fernandez, and two others, as directors. But they had very small, the remaining 20% was distributed amongst them. Now, this party, this company, authorizes one of the directors, namely Mr. Motilal Vora, to negotiate with the Congress party that this uh, National Herald Company cannot repay your loan. So we, you assign that loan to us, and we will give you 50 lakh rupees, that is 5 million rupees, as compensation for this gesture. So Mr. Motilal Nehru was asked to go and talk to the Congress treasurer who also happened to be Motilal Bora. So Motilal Bora went and spoke to Motilal Bora to say that you can't recover this 90 crores or 900 million, so you assign it to us. So it was assigned for 50 lakh rupees. Now it's another story that this company started by Sonia Gandhi and her son. The total authorized capital was only uh, five lakhs, that is half a million rupees. How they could afford to give them five million rupees, that's, other, that's part of the trial, it's, uh, but it was not necessary for me in, to reach the prima facie stage. So now, having got this assigned, then Mr. Motilal Vora went with this assignment letter to the National Herald Company and spoke to the chairman of the uh, National Herald Company, chairman of the board of directors, who also happened to be Motilal Bora. So Motilal Bora spoke to Motilal Bora of National Herald and said that, see, you cannot discharge your 90 lakhs, 90 crores. Therefore, you give us nine crore shares at, at uh, 10 rupees a share. So that will cover your debt. Of course, they never thought they'll ever be questioned, so there was no board of directors meeting. There was no shareholders meeting. There was no offering shares to uh, existing shareholders, nothing. And that 90, uh, 90 crores was assigned to, uh, was sold in lieu of that debt to this young Indian company owned by Sonia Gandhi and Rahul Gandhi. The audaciousness of this is incredible. Now, first of all, National Herald Company had assets worth 20 million rupees with prime property in all the major cities. There was no question of their not discharging this debt. So I would, you know, making, making a short of it, this was the kind of corruption that was taking place where 
every aspect of our society was being corrupted. And because they were not being caught, it just filtered down to the society. It's my theory that uh, unless you catch the people at the top, you cannot create the necessary fear factor in people at the bottom that if they can be caught, I too can be caught. It's no use catching policemen and, uh, and uh, postmen and so on. That's not going to create the necessary crime of corruption. So I went and filed a case in court while Sonia Gandhi and her party was in power. It's not my government which has enabled me to do it. And I argued, and uh, I must say, I'm quite proud to say that we have a lot of corrupt people in India, but we also have a lot of honest people in India. And this ju lady judge was fresh in appointment. And she took, of course, one and a half years of questioning me on this, asking me to produce this document, that document. And finally, she ruled that uh, they were prima facie guilty and they were, should be summoned and arrested. And then if they wanted, if they were to be given bail, they would be given bail. And that order was passed. Against that order, they went to the high court. It took a year there. I won there also. And then I went to the Supreme Court. They went to the Supreme Court. I won there, and the Supreme Court directed them to appear. And a historic scene was created in India when Sonia Gandhi, Rahul Gandhi, and those other directors had to come and stand in the dock and then be formally arrested. And then they had to supply a bond uh, a uh, and then a surety. That is, who will stand, uh, uh, who will stand and take the responsibility in case they run away. And uh, they were set out in bail. Since then, I have been seeking the original documents which I am entitled to under Indian law. And uh, by the way, this Indian law was originally framed by the British. There are some good things the British did. Uh, but uh, and it's pretty comprehensive and there's plenty of room for an individual to do these things if he has the nerve to do it so I am uh, waiting for these original documents because according to me there were no 50 lakhs given at all so I want the Congress party accounts to show me where you got it Two, that uh, the 90 crores loan claimed to be from the Congress party there's no record of it, according to my informed sources, and now I want documentation. Informed sources has ever been shown in the balance sheet of the National Herald. I think they must have given it in black money. And uh, thought no one will never come a question, there will be question. Now, I uh, want to say, uh, before my time is up, that essentially the core of fighting corruption is based on one mathematical principle or a statistical principle and that is that if my expectation of a reward from bribe is positive then I will commit the act of bribery or corruption and if the expectation is negative then I will ne do not do it. I don't need police to tell me this. I don't need courts to tell me this. I don't need anybody to tell me. I myself, out of rationality, will not do it. That is, that is, if you get a bribe, that's a certain amount. If you get caught, you lose a certain amount. You lose the entire amount. You lose your property. Maybe you lose your reputation. All these are quantifiable. So, there is a probability that you will not be caught. And by just subtracting it from one, there's a, the probability that you will, not, you will be caught. So a weighted average of probability of not being caught multiplied by the amount of the bribe plus the probability of being caught and the minus of losing this weighted average is, in my opinion, the driving force of honesty versus corruption. And therefore, we have to see 
how if the probability of being caught is small, as it's in most third world countries, how can we design punishment which is so heavy that despite the probability being small, you still feel disincentivized from going ahead. You think that is not worth the risk, however small, because of the loss that you would suffer. So I would say in India, even today, people are ashamed to be called corrupt. It's not a society where corruption is accepted openly. All corrupt politicians say they are honest, they are so simple, that they are like our, uh, like Mr. Mahatma Gandhi, who just walked around with a loin cloth on, around him, that we have nothing of our own. This is a standard refrain of all politicians. But because of this value system, if we do put into place a situation where we can rectify corruption, we can do it. There are many ways of doing it. Uh, when I came in here, everybody asked me about the demonetization. We had discussed this before the election. And according to me, it was supposed to be as a package, not just a announcement of demonetization. But somewhere, the government in its deliberation changed its mind. Second thing I, I feel that we have erred in is that the finance ministry ought to have, from the last two and a half years we were in office, prepared a contingency plan that if we do demonetize, then how do we ensure that the ordinary people, particularly in far-flung areas, be provided the uh, alternative clean money for what they have in 300, 500 rupee notes and 1,000 rupee notes. I was told when I was here by one of, our, one of your members that the freight system, freight moving system in India is now coming to a halt because it requires a truck traveling from some long distance at least 45,000 rupees to pay for what they call as octroi or toll, toll taxes. And where is he going to get that 45,000? rupees in uh, cash, which is legal. That is, he will have to get uh, in 100 rupee notes as of now. Uh, so there is no uh, uh, telling that if this kind of situation continues, we uh, may have uh, a shutdown. And uh, I'm happy to see the urgency in the prime minister's uh, thinking and uh, he has now decided that every two hours he's going to monitor uh, through the prime minister's office this and I'm sure that will come out of it. One thing we have definitely gained and I think it's worth all the misery that we have imposed and that is we have knocked out the counterfeit uh, rupee printing by Pakistan as, a, uh, as, a, as an option for now the terrorists. Earlier on, the Pakistanis had some advantage. I, can't, I can only guess, I'm not making an assertion, that they, the counterfeit notes they produced was so akin to our legal currency that it was difficult to tell it apart. And the reason was that the currency paper was the same. Now, how did the Pakistanis get that currency paper. Well, we get our currency paper by a contract with a British company called Delarue. And that same company also produces currency paper for Pakistan. So it was an error on our part to have, it was not done by our government, it was done by the previous government. It was an error on our part to have continued with that contract. Uh, because while I have no proof that the Delarue company sold them our uh, currency paper, but the fact is that the, the similarity is striking and it's something that has facilitated Pakistan to create uh, uh, this kind of uh, uh, counterfeit note. As a consequence, 
all demonstrations in Kashmir have stopped. We haven't done anything new to pacify the people there. These young people who used to come, young boys who used to come, they are no more coming. Uh, and there are long queues uh, outside the auto, uh, ATMs in Kashmir, uh, who are ordinary people going and trying to convert their 500 rupee note and 1,000 rupee notes. And this only proves to us that the agitation was being financed by Pakistan. So there we have had a major gain. And it's a very big plus. But I wish we had set up uh, kiosks in a practically every corner of, of a city in the rural areas and so on. And that could have been done by contingency planning. Even today, the finance minister says that it will take him three weeks to modify the existing ATMs to provide for the new uh, uh, 2,000 rupee notes that we are issuing. Now, if you wanted, wanted three weeks, it should have been done earlier, not after the announcement. So I've, maybe we are learning by doing, as they say. But the fact of the matter is that this is the thing that we have to do. There are other things we have to do. I will uh, deal with the other I mean, in the question time. If somebody wants to know that tomorrow, if we want to get the money that's abroad, and that's almost one trillion dollars. If you want to get it about how to do it, and uh, what is the best way to uh, bring it back to India, because that's the bigger share of participatory you know, uh, of uh, of the um, corrupt money that is abroad, and therefore, I think India wants it because I don't think for all the reportage of demonstrations, there is an equally big proportion which says we are willing to suffer this, provided it ends soon. So if in the next two weeks we are able to ensure that anybody who wants to change is now obsolete rupee, uh, 500 rupee or 1,000 rupee note, is able to get the new legitimate uh, currency, I think the entire protest will disappear and there will be celebration in India. Thank you very much. Could you comment, please, on the extent of corruption within the judiciary itself, particularly amongst the judges, because I've heard some stories. There may be some. Well, if you are saying, are there corrupt judges? Yes, they are. But uh, in a... Uh, case which has attracted public attention and media attention, will that corrupt judge be corrupt? I have my experiences, no. So of all our decisions of the courts, uh, what proportion do you think might have uh, been bought or influenced? I would say it would be not more than 20%. Uh, and uh, in the level of the Supreme Court is very difficult to say that even one judge is corrupt. He might have a political inclination, uh, and he might, but on the other hand, uh, the judge who ordered Sonia Gandhi to go and face the trial was known to be a very close friend of the Congress Party. And I appeared alone, and I don't keep lawyers because I don't trust them although my wife is a lawyer. Uh, 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 but uh, they brought in seven senior most lawyers. And uh, the, uh, the judge who is now going to be the Chief Justice of India very soon in, in January, he, a Sikh gentleman, and he, uh, everyone was expecting that he will give some relief. But he did not. And I think uh, this public mood, this social media, this focus on television, all these are now a kind of cushion for us to, to pursue corruption very seriously. So I, I would say, compared to countries in our neighborhood, we are far more honest and clean uh, than uh, one could expect. And I understand that you are quite involved in the uh, Tata uh, Air Asia. Uh, oh, yes, of controls. course. That's another corrupt thing. Yes. 
I would like to hear your views on the, uh, especially you. the High Court. Yeah. So thank you. Well, one of the saddest part of our recent corrupt history is a household name known for extraordinary honesty. The House of Tatas has now been sullied with, uh, with corruption. And there's a, a, a battle royal going on just now. I hope the, out, uh, the sacked chairman, who is supposed to be a very honest, upright person, is restored to his position. Uh, but this deal that he's referring to are two deals which uh, the government of India permitted. And that is a deal between Air Asia Malaysia and uh, two individuals, Mr. Ratan Tata and uh, one NRI uh, based in London who has now disappeared after selling his shares to uh, Mr. Tata. And the other one was for Singapore Airlines, uh, which had only with Mr. Tata. So two, airline, two uh, airlines, the, that is both uh, Air Asia as well as uh, Singapore Airlines, created a joint venture with Mr. Tata to fly, uh, to create an Indian-based airline which could fly within the country. Now the problem was that Till 2012, we did not allow any foreign direct investment in the Indian domestic airline industry. In 2012, uh, because of the economic factors, etc., that were quoted, the government of India, the cabinet of, of, the, of, of that government of that time, decided that foreign airlines can invest up to 49% of the shares in existing Indian airlines, which are in dire need of money. Now, Air Asia as well as uh, Singapore Airlines have not invested in any existing airline. Mr. Tata is not an existing airline. He is an individual. And uh, this individual cannot qualify under the uh, liberalization done by the cabinet, and therefore it was illegal. I raised it with the then previous government. It was also done by the previous government, and they didn't listen, so I went to court. And in court, um, I have uh, come pretty far. The next uh, hearing is also in December, on the 12th of December and looks like it's going to be a final hearing. In the meantime, we have, out of this scandal that has erupted in the Tata board, we have found that there is a forensic audit report which shows that Mr. Tata bribed some individuals to ensure that this deal is, goes through. So that document uh, we have got, in fact, I filed a uh, production of document uh, petition in the High Court, and the High Court has issued notice to Tatas to submit it. And I'm 100% certain that both these joint ventures will be struck down, as was in the case of the 2G Spectrum license, and uh, say that under the existing laws, it cannot be permitted. Uh, in the uh, these two airlines uh, have actually cut into our domestic airlines, and some of them uh, have suffered because of the competition. Uh, and therefore, even in terms of the need, there was no, no question about it at all. The demonetization is a one-time step, which perhaps deals with uh, the black money in India at this point yeah. in time. So firstly, how do we prevent the buildup of black money again, especially in light of a 2,000 rupee note certainly helping with that? Yes. And uh, second, of course, is the question which you asked yourself about how do we bring the black money which is abroad, which far dwarfs yeah. the money in India? Well, I answer both questions. The first one is that <clears throat> unless you create incentives not to create black money, these measures are uh, no, have no long-term effect. 
What are those measures? I would say that the first thing Indians need to feel that they don't have to cheat is the abolition of income tax. And the abolition of income tax I particularly recommend because the total revenue from it is less than the revenue you get from one auction of the 2G spectrum. Uh, 2G spectrum. After 2G, we will have auctions of 3G next year and then 4G. So at least for our term, we will have no problem of filling in the gap. I also believe that if you abolish income tax, the rate of savings will go up. And as a consequence, uh, the, uh, the investment will go up and growth will go up. And through indirect taxes, we will be able to get uh, the uh, revenue that we lose by abolishing income tax. And that's in, Ameri in America called uh, Laffer Curve or something like that. Now, uh, this is the, uh, uh, these are the kind of measures. I would also like to see that uh, indirect taxes of the, all the commodities, if you rank them by the revenue they give in indirect taxes, the first 21 give you 90% of the revenue. In my opinion, all the remaining in thousands they are, they all the excise tax from those should be removed. So when they say it's transparency and simplicity, I don't think that our people would, uh, would like to be corrupt. It's only the, the feeling that there's no other way to get what you want. Otherwise, somebody who's a crook will get it. If you are a striving industrialist or a young professional, you think, you see, this is the only way to do it. There's no other way. The people surrender. But nobody is happy to the extent that I've met, except a few, who, are ha who want to be known as corrupt people or have done cor corruption. So this is one aspect. The second thing about bringing money back from abroad, there are four known ways. One is the uh, way of having bilateral agreements. For instance, in Switzerland, we have a mutual assistance pact, but then we have to specify the details of the account and who owns it, and have a, uh, a case uh, registered within India. Now, that's a painful process. The second one is the way the G uh, Germans and the French uh, did. Uh, when uh, Chancellor Merkel found that uh, Liechtenstein Bank had many German officials having accounts, she asked the government of Liechtenstein to give, them the, give her the list, and they declined it, saying, no, this is our business and we'll be finished. So secrecy is important, and they declined. So the German government then bribed the senior most official of the Liechtenstein Bank. They gave him half a billion dollars, a US citizenship and passport, and plastic surgery to change his face. And he's now living happily uh, in the United States with a new identity. And he gave the entire, he downloaded the whole thing. So even Indian names in it have come out and the Germans have uh, uh, after the Supreme Court directed the Indian government to get these names, those names have arrived. They are still in a sealed envelope. It will come out. The Germans, uh, the French repeated this with Hong Kong Shanghai Bank. And uh, that, uh, they gave us 800 names. The Germans gave us only 24 names. But Liechtenstein is also a small country. But the Hong Kong Shanghai Bank in uh, Geneva, they gave us 887 names. And that uh, is, uh, you know, it's not being prosecuted vigorously, I'm sorry to say, but certainly given the new mood of the Prime Minister, this will be also pursued. Then the third uh, way is um, the American way. When they found that the Americans had uh, bank accounts in Credit Suisse and uh, uh, Bank of, Bank of uh, Union Bank of Switzerland, they arrested the uh, branch officials in Washington. And the next day, the Swiss people said, 
whatever you want, we are ready to do. Please live freedom. And the entire list of names were provided to the Americans. Uh, and the fourth way, which is a, uh, is a legalistic way, and that is the 2005 United Nations Resolution, which says that if a country, I mean, this is the legal interpretation, and we are going to, I'm going to try it this, uh, this parliament session. It says that if a country passes a law saying that in the secret banking countries, which is about 70 in number, all accounts of Indian citizens is hereby nationalized. The United Nations will assist you to get all these accounts credited to India. It's a, a process, so we have to pass that uh, law. And it can be done, you don't have a parliament vote and all, you can have an ordinance and then later on pass it through parliament. This is a, something which has attracted the Prime Minister's attention when I spoke to him. I'm expecting that this will lead to. And uh, it may take about a couple of years because there will be a lot of litigation and so on. We will have a proviso that if any of the bank holders say that they had, or I mean prove that they have opened these accounts legally and the money there was accountable, uh, then those, those accounts would be returned. Otherwise, all these other accounts can be brought in. And so these are the four ways in which it can be done. Um, I would like to understand the roots of corruption a bit better. Um, if you look at China, people always say China is so corrupt because they don't have a system of checks and balances. It's just one party that organizes its own anti-corruption campaign. So mainstream opinion is if China had a free press and if China had a truly independent judiciary, corruption would be much less. Now, India has had both since inception, since, um, since you became independent, and yet, obviously, it's, I don't know whether it's as corrupt as China or less, but <laughs> similar, probably. <laughs> why, why do those checks and balances not work? Well, you said free press and an independent judiciary. And uh, I think the judiciary has evolved quite a bit. I could say, by and large, it's independent. But uh, media is also become corrupt. Um, and uh, although <clears throat> recently the government uh, decided to issue a one-day ban on a prominent uh, TV station called NDTV. I'm separately prosecuting them on the Air Asia matter because they got a bribe in that. And uh, there's a money laundering case already registered against them. So we need our media also to be independent, but I don't agree that our corruption is more than China or as much as China. Uh, in China, you get caught only if uh, you're against the party there, ruling party. In India, uh, I think the process of people getting caught has started and it's going to continue. And I agree, I agree with your general proposition that if a country has an independent pr uh, free press and an independent judiciary, then that country is unlikely to have any significant corruption. Thank you very much for a very insightful talk. A token of our appreciation.